On the 10th of April 1912, the Titanic set sail from Southampton. The ship was on her maiden voyage to New York City, where from berth 44 from Southampton docks, the trip would take seven days. But with a journey like Titanic's, what food would her passengers have had on board? In this mini-series, we are going to be showing and discussing what foods that were served in all three classes. This is La Restaurant Titanic. In November 2023, famous UK auctioneers Henry Ulrich and Sons sold a newly discovered first-class dinner menu that was dated the 11th of April 1912. The menu was sold for £83,000, over $104,000 today. Although this discovered menu had some water stains, the original owner and historian, Len Stevenson, explained that on it, there are clear printed words of the food that was served on that night. The food that was served included oysters, salmon, hollandaise white rabbit, roast chicken, bread sauce, Victoria pudding and French ice cream. It isn't clear how it got off the ship following the sinking, but it is clear to see that the menu was from the dining saloon through the faded stamp of the Oceanic Steam Navigation Company logo, the company who owned the White Star Line. The words on the menu would have been printed on board the Titanic and would have been printed on an Arab Treadell press with dragon's blood. The red ink would have been made out of the resin of the Dampredone Draco plant and various rattan palm plants. Making them wasn't easy. It would take about 30 minutes to set up a printing press for each menu and then an extra half an hour to print them as well as event flyers, wine lists and private jobbing work for wealthy passengers like visiting cards and labels. A chief printer would have been in charge of printing the menus and in the Titanic's case, it was 51-year-old Abraham Mansour Mishlani. Abraham had experience as a printer on board these White Star liners, the Majestic, the Cymric, the Cedric and the Olympic. After sailing on the Olympic, Abraham travelled from Southampton to Belfast, where he signed on to the Titanic for her delivery trip. He then signed on again on the 4th of April 1912. He also had a 27-year-old assistant named Ernest Theodore Colbin. During their time on the Titanic, the White Star Line paid the men £1.50 or over $3.00 and one pound over two dollars per week. Although we have looked at the first class dining saloon in the last episode, we are going to be concentrating on the four first class restaurants that were located on A, B and C decks, beginning with the a la carte restaurant. Unlike the dining saloon menus that are in existence, there are no surviving menus from the Titanic's a la carte restaurant. However, there are records of the menus from the Olympics a la carte restaurant, which gives us a clear idea of what food was served in the restaurant. On the menu that was printed for the Olympics a la carte, dated the 28th of January 1912, the food that was served in the a la carte restaurant included a consomme dubog, a selection of hot and cold meats with a mixture of carrots, celery, onion, tomatoes and egg whites into either bullion or stock, chicken gumbo and sirloin of beef with horseradish cream. But we'll go into the a la carte menu and more of the restaurant's food later in the episode. Located on B deck, aft of the grand staircase, the a la carte restaurant on the Titanic is believed to have been the most recorded restaurant on board the Titanic, especially when it came to the interior design and the events that led up to the disaster. 
it was the toast of society and the place to dine. The restaurant was decorated in French walnut panelling, white painted panelling, a gilt bronze fixtures and damask chairs, French walnut plush chairs and Axminster carpeting in Rose du Barry. The restaurant had its own china which was specially commissioned from Royal Crown Derby, 160 pieces of silverware and it had its own independent cutlery. With a capacity of 137 guests and 49 tables, there would have been a printed menu card printed in French and bouquets of pink roses and white daisies. Some of these descriptions of the restaurant come from first-class passenger Lady Duff Gordon, who could remember the flowers and could also remember being served fresh strawberries and hot house grapes. The restaurant's interior designs were inspired by a Grade II listed building in Covent Garden, London. Although it is a rented flat in the present day, the building was called Gatti's Adelphi Restaurant, the restaurant was popular with celebrities like Noel Coward and Oscar Wilde. J. Bruce Ismay was a regular customer there and it was from 1908 that he had the idea of hiring cooks to work for the White Star Line and the two new a la carte restaurants on board the Olympic and the Titanic. In January 1910, Ismay wrote a letter to the manager of Claridge's Hotel Restaurant I am in receipt of your letter and have to advise you that it has been decided to install an a la carte restaurant on board the White Star steamers Olympic and Titanic which are at present being built. I note in your view that the only way in which such a restaurant can be kept up to date is by having it run by a large company such as the Savoy. And when we come to consider its organisation, I will bear your suggestion in mind. I further note that the managing director of the Savoy company would please himself at my disposal and should we wish to consult his, we'll not hesitate to ask his advice. However, this wasn't the first time that an a la carte restaurant was included on a liner. The first ship to have one was the Hamburg America Lines ship, the SS America. A copy of the ship's lunch and dinner menu survives, which is dated the 12th of March 1908. From this, we can see that the ship had provided a 12-course meal in English, French and German. The food that was served on the SS America included grilled fillet of salmon, roast campon and turtle soup. In the same year as the dated menu, the White Star Line was drawing up blueprints for the Olympic and the Titanic. One design, known as Design D, didn't include the restaurant. This was changed in the later stages. When the Olympic made her maiden voyage, Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer, inspected the a la carte restaurant and in his notes he recorded to propose fitting 11 additional four-seated tables in the first-class restaurant as per plan, this room being short of table accommodation. A screen to be an improvement if fitted on the side of the restaurant slash buffet supped entrance door so as it to prevent passengers from seeing behind the buffet and one from the pantry and the other for the restaurant itself. While it is the best restaurant to visit on board the Titanic, it was also the most expensive, so only the richest passengers could afford a seat at one table. Visiting the restaurant wasn't included in the price of a first-class ticket, so passengers had to book and pay separately to dine there. According to a 2010 article by the Scotsman newspaper, the cost of a ticket to the restaurant would be around $4,500, around the same amount of money to book a millionaire's suite back in 1912. 
The restaurant was run independently by an Italian restaurateur, Luigi Gatti. Gatti was renowned for being a successful businessman, and although he wasn't their employee or passenger, Gatti was hired by Bruce Ismay to manage the a la carte restaurants on the Olympic and the Titanic. He also was responsible for running the Café Parisian. Also, in London, he ran Ordino's Imperial Restaurant. Working behind the scenes at the Alicata restaurant, Gatti would work with 60 staff members from France, Switzerland and Italy. 10 out of the 60 were his cousins. However, all the kitchen staff weren't White Star employees and they weren't passengers either. Instead, they were all employed and paid for by Gassi himself, who had a reputation for supporting and demanding high standards from his employees. Some had fascinating records of previous employment. A few were recruited directly from Italy, while others had previously worked in London restaurants and on board the Olympic. One of these employees was poor Mummy. Mami was a secretary to the restaurant's head chef, Pierre Ronsonou. Working for Monsuru, Mami would have been responsible for overseeing their team. With many passengers to feed, conditions in the kitchens would have been hard considering how he, Ronsonou, and their 35 cooks had to deliver the level of food service daily. Born in Paris and before Titanic, Mami had never worked on an ocean liner. His life is a mystery, though it is believed that Mami moved from Paris to London before he signed on to Titanic. When he did, he put down his address as Co Gatti, London. It is not clear, but it is thought that he gave his address based on where he worked. At the time, Mami was likely working with Ronsonou at either one or both of Ronsonou's restaurants in London, Gatti's Stand and Gatti's Adolfi. At the Alicata restaurant on the Titanic, he was the highest paid crew member of the four departments and was paid a monthly salary of over £15. Mummy, Ronsonou and the cooks in the Alicata restaurant would be one group who would prepare 6,000 meals a day. They had to work around the clock as there was a tight timetable of when meals had to be prepared and served on time. They would work 15-hour shifts from 8am to 11pm. This would have been similar to the other cooks for the other three restaurants on board the ship. At the beginning of each day, the ship's purser would have visited the head chef and the cooks to discuss the meals of the day. This would have been either before or a little after 8am when their shifts would start. When the menus were sorted, storekeepers would begin collecting the ingredients for the menus. There were eight storekeepers on the Titanic and their job was to make sure that there was enough food for the rest of the crew and passengers on board. Before this, food would have to be collected at port in Southampton docks and would have to be stored at the correct temperature in separate rooms on G-Deck. In dedication to the foods on G-Deck, the ship would have over 20 rooms based on categories. These would include rooms for milk, butter, bacon, ham and cheese, meat and pollery, and vegetables, fish and ice cream. There were even three rooms for ice and ice making machines. To transport the food from the storage rooms to the galleys, the staff would have to travel into these rooms through a system of elevators to the first and second class galleys located on D-Deck. For the third class galley, the staff would have to walk the food over to it and from the other two galleys from G to F decks. During the maiden voyage, first class would be treated to opulent dining, which was the cornerstone of high society during the Edwardian era. 
Although it was familiar to the aristocracy in the UK, the dining experiences had become an adopted custom to European and particularly American aristocrats. On the Titanic, the a la carte restaurant play host to entertainment and satisfaction of the passengers on board. With long hours, 11 course meals and many social gatherings, it was up to Perry Ronsou and his staff to deliver the finest meals on board the White Star Liner. In the restaurant and for meal times, breakfast would be served from 8 to 10 a.m., lunch from 1 to 2.30 p.m. and dinner between 7 and 8.15 p.m. Passengers would also have been served cocktails in the reception room while waiting to be served before dinner. But because of its expense, the restaurant remained solidly booked throughout the maiden voyage. There's no information on why it was, but a possible theory was the high expectations and praise of the a la carte restaurant on the Olympic. So, to maybe continue with this excellence, the customer service on the Titanic's a la carte would be expected to be up to the finest standards. From the environment mentioned earlier to the service of waiters like Giovanni Basilio. There's little information on Giovanni's early life, but what we do know was that he was born in Italy, but he had moved to London later in his life and that the Titanic was his first ship. Giovanni signed on to the Titanic on the 6th of April 1912 before boarding at Southampton on the 10th. Like restaurants on cruise ships today, meals were ordered from menus and waiters had to serve each meal to every table, either with trolleys or trays. There were surviving records of how special trolleys were used to deliver menus, with one example being hot soup like green turtle soup. However, the guests and waiters would be overseen by the restaurant's cashiers, including Ruth Harwood Bulker or Janet to her friends and family. Before the Titanic, Ruth was living in Lancashire and she was working as a ladies maid. But like some of her colleagues on board, she had previously worked on the Titanic's sister ship, the RMS Olympic, as a restaurant cashier. Ruth was one of two females who worked in the restaurant and as a cashier person, she would focus on the accounts and earnings that were received on board. She even had her own office, though the location of the cashier's offices isn't known. On the morning of the 14th of April, passengers sat down to breakfast. Most breakfast items that were served on board include sausages, eggs including boiled eggs and omelette, stewed prunes, fresh fruit, honey and Quaker oats. However, there was odd food to eat. This includes fish, vegetable stew, potatoes, watercress, sirloin steak and scones. The fish that was served at the breakfast table were fresh herrings, Finland haddock and smoked salmon. First class passengers had other options to eat like mutton, kidneys and bacon, mashed and jacket potatoes. In between the meals, passengers would have attended Sunday service in the first class lounge and would have gone about their day whether walking on the promenade decks, participating in various sports activities relaxing in the reading room or engaging in group conversations. First class passenger Colonel Archibald Gracie recorded his events during that Sunday morning. I was up early before breakfast and met the professional racket player in a half hour's warming up preparatory for a swim in the six foot deep tank of salt water heated to a refreshing temperature. At lunchtime, some passengers noticed an odd orientation when the ship had a slight list to port. They also noticed a slight drop in the temperature. The Duff Gordons had a conversation about the weather change. Lucy Duff Gordon recalled, The wind was the coldest I have ever felt. As we walked around the deck, I shivered in my warmest furs. I have never felt so cold, I said to Cosmo. Surely there must be icebergs around. 
However, the temperature didn't put people off from having an appetite. Lunch was served at 1 p.m. and, like breakfast, the passengers were treated to an elegant buffet. There was a selection of potatoes, meat, fish, vegetables, and cheese. There were also luxurious dishes. Most were cockaliki, a Scottish soup which is made out of leeks and peppered chicken stock thickened with barley. Consummate thermia, which contained scrambled eggs with asparagus. Egg a la agritol, scrambled eggs with poached asparagus and served with a cream sauce and apple moran. There was even a buffet of salmon, shrimp, herrings and sardines, anchovies, beef, ham, ham pie and vegetables. But the buffet also included brawn, which is meat taken from the head of either a calf, pig, sheep or cow, bolognese sausage, ground meat with a combination of pork, beef, chicken and turkey, ox tongue, and the galanti of chicken, which is a dish of boned stuffed meat which is a poached and coated with a speck. When the sun set for a final time in the early evening and by 7pm ship's time, all guests were seated for dinner. At a table in the middle of the a la carte restaurant, J. Bruce Ismay and Dr. O'Lonigan had a private conversation about the ship had turned a corner, making her final turn to line up with the entrance to New York Harbour. Earlier, the ship had made an error in her course and during this time, Ismay noticed that the Titanic was entering a field of ice. However, he was enthusiastic about the progress the Titanic was making and with great excitement, he and Dr. O'Lonigan stood up from his seat and raised his glass of champagne crying, let us drink to the mighty Titanic. The dinner menu is recognisable and it features a variety of exquisite and artistic meals. They included oysters, consomme olga cream of barley, Fillet mignon lily or steak, saltaire of chicken lyonnaise, lamb and roast duckling with mint and apple sauces. The menu also included sirloin of beef, roast squab, punch romaine, walled off pudding, peaches and jelly, French ice cream, and chocolate and vanilla eclairs. For vegetarians like suffragette Eloisa Bowman, another option had been added to the menu for them, and that was vegetable marrow farsi. During Titanic's voyage, vegetarianism was passed in its evolution, with the founding of the first vegetarian society in the mid-19th century. Some women in the suffragette movement were recorded as being vegetarians because they believed in the mistreatment of living creatures like lambs, cows and ducks. Ice cream was a very popular choice for dessert. However, for first class passengers, the ice cream that they would have was French ice cream. Second class passengers would have had American ice cream. Both ice cream recipes were made by Adolf Matman, who was the restaurant's ice cream man or ice cream maker. Before the Titanic, Adolf was an apprentice confrontier at a pastry shop, the Karl Halbrechtier in Switzerland. Later on, he went to Germany where he studied French and from 1910 to 1911, he returned to Switzerland to work at the Hotel Lowen. He moved to England in October 1911, where he worked presumably working as a pastry chef or iceman on board the RMS Olympic. In the spring of 1912, Adolf had a job offer at an unknown hotel in London. However, before taking on the role, he decided to sign a new contract on board the Titanic. But the most infamous occasion that was recorded by passengers was the retirement party for Captain Smith, which was hosted by the Wideners. American businessman George Dutton Widener and his wife Eleanor. Dining with them were Archibald Butt, William and Lucia Carter, and John B. Thayer II and Mariam Thayer. 
There's no record if it was or wasn't, but it would have been likely a private dinner. This would have been shown if a little a clove was shown around the table. An enclove is a small area of a room that's formed into a screen so no one can see a party having their meal if they aren't participating in private dining. Although there weren't any surviving menus from the restaurants, it was likely that the group had ordered delicious French cuisine, including patatiers en parmesan, French crisps in the form of biscuits, and fillet de sole. The dinner had concluded at 9pm on that evening, but according to passenger Charles Stengel, he had recalled the captain didn't drink any beverages, but he smoked two cigars and left the dining room at about 10 o'clock. Around the same time, a wireless message from the Masaba was sent to the Titanic's operators, and the captain would have received it after leaving the restaurant. Captain Smith returned to the bridge where he discussed with second officer Charles Lightoller. Before retiring to bed, the captain gave instructions to Lightoller, saying that if the weather became worse, the ship could slow down and if there was any trouble, Lightoller could let him know. Following the dessert course, the meal ended with wine and cheese. On board, there was a generous selection of French and English cheeses, which included Stilton, Edam, Cheshire and St. Ival. Titanic's first class wine list would have a rare selection of 10 different types of alcoholic drinks. These would have included claret, port and vermouth. While the wine and cheese courses were still being served, the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg and soon she sank below in the North Atlantic Ocean. Next time, we will be looking into the Alicata's restaurant's next-door neighbour, the Café Parisien.